Now we're going to look at ionic bonds, which make ionic compounds. We're going to look at not only the compounds themselves, but, and this can be the most challenging part, how they're named. Okay, so before we even really technically get to that, let's talk about octet. Do you remember your electron configurations from the last chapter? And we talked about valence electrons, which are the outermost electrons. So for instance, in helium, which has an electron configuration of 1s2, well, those two electrons are the highest outermost level. So those two electrons, that's all helium has, two valence shell electrons. Neon, you can see the electron configuration there. And again, pardon my superscripts. Remember, the number of electrons is always written as a superscript, okay? So this is what it should be. And I apologize, the slide's a little off. And when you add up these three numbers, two plus two plus six, <clears throat> there's a total, whoops, a total of 10 electrons total in ne neon. However, the highest level, two plus six, eight valent shell. So 10 total electrons, which again is equal to the atomic number. And then for neon, this is all for neon, there's eight valence shell electrons. Argon, you can see what argon's configuration is. Argon's outermost highest level is the third level. Two plus six, it's a total of eight for argon. Okay, This is going to be really important for what we're going to look at in terms of both ionic and covalent bonding. So it's important to understand and know um, valence electrons. All right, now one other thing, and let me see if I can blow this up a little bit and help you. I guess I can't. Um, all right, so if we look at elements in the same columns, technically called groups, things like the noble gases, halogens, alkali metals or alkaline earth, those are just some nicknames, but all the elements in a column, if you remember back to my electron configuration talk, these are the in the S block, these guys over here, the six columns of P's, these here, transition metals, are the ten columns of D, and then even though we're not actually probably going to look at these, these are the F blocks, and if you were to count up the short little stubby columns, there's 14. S's, remember, are maxed out with 2, D's are maxed out at 10, P's at 6, and F at 14. And that's also equal to the number of columns. S has 2 columns, P has 6, and so on and so forth. Okay, but let me erase this. So I just wanted you, whoops, I just wanted you to remember what the, oops, I guess I can't erase anything more than that. I wanted you to remember is terms of electron configurations because what happens and the reason that the elements that are in the same column have such similar properties is that their outermost, those valence electrons, those numbers are actually the same if they're in the same column. Now again, forgive my scribble because it now won't let me erase it, but everything in the first column, whoo, hello, everything in the first column, let's see if I can fix that. Ah. My tablet doesn't like me today, guys, sorry. Everything in the first column is an S1. So regardless if it's 1S1, like helium, or hydrogen, or whether it's 1S2, 2S1, like lithium, or 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S1, sodium, they all have the highest S1. Or in terms of counting total valence electrons, everything in group 1 has just one valence electron. And then the same can be said for the second column, and that is 2. And there you can see these numbers at the top of the columns. Okay. Well, you got to be careful of that because over here on this side, the 1s and the 2s match up with how many valence electrons there are. Okay. However, hopefully you know, helium, neon, those guys don't have 18 valence electrons. No way. Instead, what number should you be looking at? The number with the A or the number with the Bs. Okay. That's the number that's your shortcut for knowing and very quickly determining how many valence electrons a particular element has. Now, helium is my one exception. You always, always got to have an exception, right? Think about, let me do it down here, helium... Its electron configuration is 1s2. 
That's it. It only has two total electrons. Its atomic number is two, two total electrons. Well, it can't have eight valence shell electrons if it only has two to begin with. So other than helium, you have to kind of think about helium sitting right here next to hydrogen when you're talking about that. Um, so the question is, why doesn't helium sit next to hydrogen on the periodic table? Well, helium is a noble gas, and in fact, all the noble gases have a filled highest level. Whether it's the 1s2, that's full, the first floor is filled for helium. Whether it's the second floor, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, the second floor is filled for neon, third floor is filled for argon, the fourth floor is filled for krypton. You see where I'm going with this, right? So noble gases all have a filled highest level, regardless of what the level is. That's going to be important because what that does, not only does it give it very similar properties, but for the most part, noble gases are very, very inert, which means they don't react much with anything. We're going to talk about reacting in just a second here, um, but that's the reason you won't see noble gases typically listed in things we're going to do, honestly, much in this class at all, okay? So, but back to my valence shell electrons, how to very quickly determine how many valence electrons a particular element has. You find it on the periodic table, so for instance, let's say I was doing phosphorus. Phosphorus is in group 5A, and you use the 5, not the 15, okay? Phosphorus happens to have 15 electrons, but in terms of valence electrons, you use the number that's with the letter. So phosphorus, each pho atom of phosphorus has five valence electrons. And being able to determine, calculate those valence electrons is going to be very important for the next couple of chapters and things we're going to talk about. Okay, back to a clean slide. Here's where I'm gonna distinguish for you the difference between what we're talking about in this lecture, ionic, and what we're gonna talk about in the other lecture, covalent, okay? It's right here. And in fact, let's just title this slide, ionic versus covalent, okay? And in fact, it's right here, okay? What's going on? Let's split it down the middle here. These guys make ionic, bonds, therefore ionic compounds, these guys make covalent. Now, can you see and figure out what the abbreviation M and NM is? We don't have any elements with the abbreviation NM or just an M. No, M stands for, some of you figured it out? That's right, metal. NM, well now that you know what that stands for, I'm guessing you can figure this one out. NM stands for nonmetal. Here's the really easy thing, guys. If you have an ionic compound, there's a metal present. The only type of bond that we're gonna talk about in this class, at least, that metals form ionic bonds. Covalents can do, can do either, or excuse me, non-metals can do either, covalent or ionic, but the metals will only participate in an ionic bond. So, for instance, if you're giving a, given a list of compounds and asked which are ionic or which are covalent, all you have to do is look for a metal. Metals are listed first as well in their formula, but metals only participate in ionic. If you've got a metal, you've got an ionic. Okay, <clears throat> now, what else are we talking about on this slide? Well, the difference between ionic and covalent in addition to what types of elements are involved. But if you read this right here, an ionic bond is when you have a complete exchange of electrons. And the metals are the ones who, like I, say, I like to say like parents, metals give away, they're very generous with their money. Let's say their money, they're, they're, it's really electrons. So the parent or the metal gives away at least one some metals are very generous, we'll see in a minute, but metals give away at least one electron and they give it up to their kid, who I like to call the non-metal. So a complete exchange of electrons, you've got your ionic bond. Non-metals, well these would be like two kids, and if you're a parent and you're listening to this, you can probably imagine one of your kids giving money to your other kid. Nah, instead they come to an agreement and they share their money or they share the electrons. Now, why in the world would they do either one? Okay, why would some share? Why do some give away, some gain, all that? It all comes back to what we just talked about on the last slide, valence electrons. 
And, a little further than that, all elements aspire to be like a noble gas. And remember, noble gases have a filled highest level. Whatever that level is doesn't matter, but it has a filled highest level. 1s2 or 2s2 2p6, okay? That's filled. That makes them inert. They're very, very happy, very stable, very unreactive. So all the other elements on the periodic table work to achieve that electron configuration by either gaining or losing electrons or, or sharing electrons if they have to. But remember, octet is eight, okay? Everybody's looking to have eight around them. In some cases, it's easier to give up electrons, and in some cases, it's easier to gain them. So for instance, let's look at this lithium and chlorine here that are interacting. Lithium being a metal, chlorine being my non-metal, and these little dots, you know what those represent? Well, they're not very well represented here, so let me, let me fix this up a little bit. Lithium's okay. Lithium has one valence electron. So wherever you wanna put around lithium, one dot, you've got one dot. And if lithium gets into a container with chlorine, it's gonna be real happy. So will chlorine. Chlorine's electron dot, we call this. Chlorine was in column 7A. So chlorine has seven dots around it. And again, however you want to place them, but forgive my slide, it looks kind of sloppy. So this is what the chlorine atom looks like. Neutral chlorine atom has seven valence electrons. Octet is eight. Things are happy when they have eight, like the noble gases. So, or a filled highest level. So chlorine, boy, chlorine just needs this one little electron. It just needs to find one electron to be happy to be satisfied to have a filled highest level. Lithium so happens to have one little electron. Now, lithium's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s1. Now, lithium's not gonna end up with eight, okay? It's got far too few. It's never gonna make that eight. However, again, filled highest outer, outermost level, that's what makes it stable. So if lithium can give this one away, that 2s1 electron, there's one electron in there. If it gives this guy here, that's this one here. Do, 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 do. If it gives that one away, if it finds someone to take that one electron, then it's filled highest level one, principal energy level n equals one, s orbit would be filled with two and that would make it stable. That would leave lithium with the same electron configuration as helium, 1s2. That's stable, that's inert, that's happy. So instead of finding seven to go up to a total of eight, the question I always ask, and pretty obvious I think the answer, is it easier to give one away or find seven? Of course, it's easier to give one away, and especially if, lith if, if chlorine excuse me, is sitting right there with its hand out going, hey, I just need one. So lithium donates the electron to chlorine, and when it does that, what actually happens, lithium goes from something that was neutral with its three total electrons, it's given one away, now it only has two. Think back to protons and electrons. When it's neutral, I have three of each. If it gives one away, now it only has two electrons. If I have three positive protons and two negative electrons, Guess what, do the math on that. I have a plus one charge. So when lithium gives away an electron, it ends up as a plus one. And that's what this shows right here, whoops. And again, lithium and all the other elements in its column, S1 is their outermost electron configuration. So all the elements in the first column on the periodic table are looking to give one electron away because when they're neutral they start out with just that one electron or if you want to look at their electron configurations let's do sodium real quick 1s2 2s2 2p6 sodium is 3s1 again everything aspires to have the same electron configuration as a noble gas so the question is sodium can either find seven plus seven to fill the third level or 2p6 
six, three as one. Or it can simply try to give this one away, leaving the second level as its outermost and filled. And it doesn't really care if it's the second level or the third level. The goal is a filled octet, filled highest level. So again, give one away or find seven. Of course, it's easier to give one away. Okay, now that explains the metals. And, and let me, in fact, go a little, go one step further here, guys. This is just the column one metals. But if we look at something like magnesium, magnesium is a two plus ion meaning it gives two electrons away, and that's because it's in the S block second column. So it has, again, find eight minus two, find six, or give its two outermost away, again, leaving it with a filled, filled highest level. Give two away or find six, give two away is easier. And magnesium then has two electrons less than it did when it was neutral, meaning there's two more positive protons than the negative electrons, and the overall charge is a two plus. And that's what the metals do. The metals are very generous creatures, and they give electrons away. What about, however, the non-metals? Why does chlorine just want one? Well, again, think about its electron configuration. This is for chlorine, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. And again, the idea, I'm looking for a filled highest level. So, man, it's so close. 3s2, 3p5, or 2 plus 5 is 7 when it's neutral. So chlorine only needs to find 1. Or it could give 7 away. But given the right situation, put it near lithium, put it near sodium, put it near, in fact, any metal who's looking to give electrons away, what an ideal situation, and they very readily exchange electrons, and that's a reaction. When electrons are exchanged, that's considered a chemical reaction. So sure, chlorine's going to find one. Now, let's talk about the charge on the chloride, we call it, a chloride ion, when it has a charge. So chlorine, when it's neutral, when it's neutral, has 17 positive protons and 17 negative electrons, because its atomic number is 17. But if chlorine gains one electron, all right, my protons never change, they're 17. If I gain, if I'm chlorine and I gain an electron, well now do the math. Positive 17 plus a negative 18, because each electron is negative one, positive 17 plus a negative 18, that's a negative one or one, neg one minus, or just negative, however you want to illustrate it, but that's the charge on chlorine after it, after it has gained the electron. So you cannot just simply say Cl. Very, very huge difference between chlorine atom and this chloride ion. Very, very big difference in terms of reactivity, everything. Chlorine happens to be a very toxic, deadly gas. The chloride ion, we consume that in our diets all the time. It's in salt, toxic, non-toxic, okay? So even that difference right there. So it's very important to be able to distinguish whether you're writing and talking about an element that's neutral or whether it has a charge, positive, like for these metals we were just talking about here, or the non-metals that are negative, okay? So again, back to my whole mess that I've got here going on, guys. Erase all this. Okay. So that's what ionic bonds, how they result. They result from an exchange of electrons. Okay. Now let's real quickly talk about covalent, even though I have the lecture about covalent. But let's talk about it here real quick. So two chlorines, okay, two chlorines. Chlorines, if we want to look at it in terms of these Lewis dots, okay, each chlorine neutral has seven electrons. Now, Assume that we don't have chlorine near a metal. All I've got is a sample of chlorine, a box, a container, probably a gas cylinder, something like that, full of chlorine atoms. Well, guess what happens? There's nobody who's looking to give a handout, to give away the one electron. So instead, chlorine kind of goes, well, better than nothing, how about we share? We share these two electrons, and the sharing of electrons is what's called a covalent bond. You share, 
electrons. And although it's not ideal because, well, yeah, technically neither one is getting one complete electron, they still end up with eight around them, even if it's shared, and that results in happy neutral atoms. And in fact, chlorine does this so readily that chlorine is one of the seven diatomics. Di means what? What? Two. Right. Chlorine, when found in nature, is actually diatomic. You won't find chlorine atoms. You won't find just a Cl atom floating around all by itself. It's extremely reactive. Okay? And instead, what happens, as I just showed you here, chlorine will naturally form a covalent bond with another chlorine. Okay, but real quick, back to these diatomic, well, diatomics while I'm on it, because it's a good time to talk about it. There are actually seven diatomic elements. Of all the elements on the periodic table, seven are diatomic. Which seven are they? Well, let's see if I can... There's a funky word that I'm going to tell you about and show you. Let's see, what's my next Ooh, color here, guys? Sorry. Okay, how do I pronounce this crazy funky word? Brinklehof. Brinklehof. B-R-I-N-C-L-H-O-F. Brinklehof. And in the word Brinklehof are the symbols for the seven elements that are just like chlorine for the same reasoning and everything I just showed you. They make covalent bonds with themselves and this is how they're found in nature because they makes them very stable. So bromine, if we're ever talking about bromine in a reaction, bromine is actually Br2. Iodine is I2. Nitrogen is N2. Even the oxygen that you're breathing right now in the air, well, there's also a lot of nitrogen in the air. It's primarily nitrogen. But nitrogen and oxygen that make up the air that you're breathing right now, you're breathing in and out N2. And O2. Well, you're breathing in O2. You're breathing out. Well, forget it. We'll talk about that later. Anyways, these seven, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, those seven elements, when we start looking at reactions, I'll remind you of this. Hey, remember when we talked about diatomics? Those seven elements are found as a pair, or I like to call them twins, involved in a covalent bond with themselves. Okay. On though to the next slide. So this is also just depicting and explaining why when sodium loses an electron, remember those numbers I was just scribbling, why it has a positive one charge. It's, it's really the opposite of what your brain wants to instinctively tell you. Typically you think if something is losing something, it's going to have a negative charge. Well, since protons are positive and they, those numbers never change, and electrons are negative, that's where it comes into play. So for instance, if I have a positive 11 charge, which 11 times plus 1, because each proton is plus 1, is a positive 11. And if I have a negative 10, each electron is negative. 10 times negative 1 is negative 10. Positive 11 plus a negative 10, well, that ends up with a plus 1. And you'll see sometimes I, we use the plus and sometimes we use the plus 1. If there's no number written with a positive or a negative, you assume it's 1. You have to write any other number, like a 2 or a 3. But if there's no number and just a plus or no number with the minus, assume it is one. Now, magnesium, remember, look at its electron configuration. When it's neutral, magnesium has those two kind of extra electrons. Find six or lose two, it's going to very easily lose those two. And then if you do the math, it'll end up with a positive two or typically we put it as a two plus, two additional positive protons. Okay. Let's go back really quick. I'm sorry, I didn't finish the naming part of this. So, metals always retain their name, just like it is on the periodic table. Oops. Okay. Nonmetals, nonmetals get an IDE ending. Oops. Ah, sorry guys, I'm having a problem with my slide here. Well, it's not going to let me write, but nonmetals have an IDE ending. So nitrogen changes to nitride, phosphorus phosphide, oxygen oxide. You see where I'm going with this. So metals retain their name, 
Nonmetals change to IDE. Things that are negatively charged are called anions. And then anything in the second column where beryllium, magnesium, okay, those guys, those all form plus two, as for the reasons I just showed you. They're all looking to give two away, and once they do, they've got two more protons than they do electrons. Aluminum and its friends plus three, and we skip up here this top column. We'll talk about tin in a little bit. Um, now let's look at the non-metals. Helium, neon, those guys aren't going to do anything. Okay, They're not ever going to participate in these, so we're not even going to worry about those. But the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, when they, whoops, when they participate in these ionic compounds, like I just showed you, they gain electrons, and so they're going to be a negative one or a one negative, however you want to write it, or just a minus. Okay, These guys will all gain one and only one, because they're all p5s for their electron configuration so they only need to find one they won't pick up any more than that so anytime you're dealing with any of these guys there'll be a minus one oxygen and his and sulfur and those guys as you can see right there a two minus well electron configuration s2p4 two plus four is six so it just needs to find two more and when they do two additional electrons will give it a that negative two or two negative charge and then nitrogen and phosphorus, as you can see from the chart up above, they are S2P, what is that, 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. Well, finding 3, gaining 3 electrons makes the filled outermost level. So there's your octet of 8. So that's why these guys, these two nonmetals, only these two, are looking for 3. So anytime we have... Anything in these two column or in, in any of these columns that I just marked, and in fact, if you've got your own periodic table, I would mark these numbers above these columns. It's just easier than having to look this chart up every time. Okay? Any element in the first column, when it forms an ion, it forms an ion as a plus one because it gives one electron away. Anything in the second column, plus two. The column over here, we skip these guys, we'll we'll talk about them later. But these guys here plus three, then we skip this. Minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, and nothing for the noble gases. Okay, before I go on, though, let's talk about carbon and its friends. Why did I, why did I say carbon does nothing when everything else kind of seems to do something? Well, let me put these numbers up here again. This isn't going to do anything. Minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Nothing for carbon. Plus 3, plus 2, plus 1. Okay, so let's talk about, for instance, just carbon. Carbon is 1s2. 2s2, 2p2. So again, go to the idea, the octet, that the highest level would have a total of 8. That keeps it happy stable. Well, carbon has 2 plus 2, a total of 4 when it's neutral. Well, think back to what I was just saying. Either give some away or find some. Which is easier? It'll, that's what it'll do. Metals, it's easier to give a few away than find a whole bunch. Non-metals, it's easier to find one or two than give a bunch away. Well, carbon sits right in the middle, can't make up its mind. Carbon's like Switzerland. Is it going to gain four or lose four? I can never decide. So you won't see carbon all by itself as an ion. You'll see it with these other things we talk about, but you won't see it just by itself. Carbon can't make up its mind. It doesn't know, and I don't have any metals that really want to just give four away typically, so or give them away to something like carbon. So you're not going to see carbon listed, and that's the reason. Okay, and then when we go to, let's look at something like sodium chloride, you'll see how this works. Sodium is Na, and as I said, retains the name of the metal from the periodic table. Chlorine, which is what it mixes with, chlorine, the name changes to chloride when I'm talking about something in a substance, in a compound. So just by saying sodium, that doesn't tell me whether it's in a compound or not. I call sodium neutral atom sodium. I call sodium and sodium chloride sodium. But the non-metal name will change. So for instance, chlorine, when I mention chlorine, I'm referring to that diatomic Cl2. When I'm talking about chloride, I-D-E ending, the nonmetals get an IDE ending. Chloride, I'm talking about the ion. 
huge, huge difference, as I said a minute ago, and so it's really important to distinguish between their names, but then that also tells me, okay, I've got an ion. We don't have that luxury with the metals. I'm not sure who came up with this idea, but the metals don't change their name, whether it's neutral sodium or whether it's sodium ion. Okay, you, we can use the word ion, add it to it, but when we actually put it together and name a compound, it's just sodium. The non-metal, however, gets a different ending. Okay, now, the formula. How do we know what the formula for sodium chloride is? Well, an ionic compound or ionic formula for a compound, key here is neutral. So it just so happens in this particular example, sodium is looking to give one away, one electron. Chlorine, chloride, is it gonna become, but chlorine atom, a single atom, is looking to gain one electron. So it'll be a one to one ratio. But regardless of whether it's a one-to-one -one ratio or not, the idea for any ionic compound, metal to non-metal, your total positives and total negatives are gonna add up to be the same. Five and five, or three and three, or one and one, for instance, with sodium and chloride. Because I wanna make something that is neutral. Something that is neutral. And we're gonna play with this idea here in just a second. And the other thing in terms of symbols, how do we write, how do we know which one we write first? You always write the, the metal first and then the non-metal. And the name will follow in that same order as well. We name the metal first, sodium. We took name the, the non-metal second, the chloride. And then in terms of symbols, same thing, okay? I keep, how I remember this, one of two ways. M comes before N alphabetically, or, or the metals are on the left-hand side of the periodic table, the non-metals are on the right, left and right. Either way, or maybe you've got your own way to remember it, but that's how it works for ionic compounds. Okay, so I talked about sodium. When sodium forms an ion, it's plus one, chloride minus one, they come together. Oh, that's a terrible arrow, you guys, sorry. They come together and make NaCl. That's the formula because it's a one to one ratio works out perfect. Sodium's looking to give one away. The chlorine's looking to gain one. They swap all as well. That's the formula for sodium chloride. And I've got lots of things that have one to one ratios. Um, for instance, magnesium when it's an ion is a two plus. Oxygen is a two minus. So magnesium is looking to give two away. Oxygen is looking to gain two. This is another one-to-one -one ratio. And whenever you have a one-to-one -one ratio, that means you need one of each. One-to-one -one ratio, one of each. So the way magnesium and oxygen would come together when they're ions would simply be one magnesium, one oxygen. And the other thing you'll note that we don't actually write the subscript one, it's implied, okay? No number there, oops, you can assume it's one, okay? Anything other than one we have to write. So again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is the shortcut, the helpful hint. If you have a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of the char the, the number on the charge, if they are the same, one here, positive one, negative one, positive two, negative two, positive three, negative three. If the number is the same, I call that a one-to-one -one ratio, one metal will satisfy one non-metal. You need one of each when you're writing the formula. But again, we don't usually ever include the formula. I mean the, sorry, the number unless it's greater than one. Okay, now Let's look at when it's not one-to-one. -one. Whoops. Let's look at when it's not one-to-one. -one. Oops, uh-oh. Hang on, guys. Sorry. Okay, sorry, I guess I can't erase that. I'm screwing with my screwing up with my slides here and my little tablet. Okay, I gotta leave that on there. I'm sorry. Well, let me change it now. Okay, what happens when it's not one-to-one? -one? So for instance, magnesium becomes a two plus ion, but we know chlorine or chloride as an ion is minus one. Or down here, sodium is plus one or positive. Sulfur, which becomes, we call it sulfide, is a two minus. Well, here's the deal. When the numbers are not the same, one and two, two and one, they might even be three and two, three and one. 
when the numbers are not the same, you do what's called crossover. Okay, so for instance, if you look over here at these pictures, one magnesium, a magnesium has two it's looking to give away for reasons I explained earlier. So each magnesium, one magnesium I should say, can actually satisfy two different chlorine atoms. One magnesium can satisfy two chlorine atoms because remember, chlorine's looking to gain one. Magnesium wants to give two away. So the formula for magnesium chloride, one magnesium, satisfies quantity two chlorides or chlorine atoms before they become ions. Okay, one to two, cross it over. I need two of these guys. I need one of these guys. That's what I call crossover. And you use crossover when you have two different numbers. When you have the same, positive two, negative two, positive one, negative one, one to one ratio I call it, you need one of each. When the numbers are different, you cross them over. So let's apply that idea to the sodium and the sulfur. Sodium is plus one, sulfur is minus two. Different numbers, so you cross them over. I'm gonna need two sodiums and want to satisfy one sulfur. And again, if you think about it in terms of what's going on chemically in these, with these electrons, each sodium is looking to give one away. Well, sulfur, each and every sulfur, is looking to gain two. Well, so I'm gonna need two sodiums to be able to satisfy the one sulfur, Na2S. Again, one is assumed. I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't put the S for sulfur there if sulfur wasn't present. So you only write the number if it's more than one. Now, you guys, while I'm talking about this, let me just kind of a little reminder in terms of subscripts and superscripts. One, make sure when you're doing your homework, your exams, when you're doing things, that you're, you're um, good on the computer in putting them in with the proper subscript or superscript. What's the difference? Well, subscripts... Those are the quantities in our formulas, okay? Subscripts, the guys that go up here, subscripts, those are charges. So be really careful. Make sure you're putting it in the computer right. Make sure you know how to use the program and how it accepts um, subscripts and superscripts so that you're writing formulas correctly. Some practice for you here. Well, the one, this is kind of silly. We just did this one. But how about you try B and C? And again, apologize because I'm just telling you to put them in correctly in terms of subscripts versus superscripts. So let me fix it because, sorry, when I transferred these over from PowerPoint to my program that I use on my iPad, it took away all the sub, um, subscripts and superscripts. Okay, so here are the two in letter B that you're putting together, you're gonna to put together the aluminum ion with the chloride ion. And in C, you're looking to put the magnesium ion with the nitrogen, or we call nitride ion. I'm gonna give you a minute here. I'm gonna give you a minute. See if you can write the formula for what ionic compound results when these two ions come together. Hit the pause button, and then when you're ready, come back and hit play and you can check your work. All right, did you get this? AlCl3, one aluminum, three chlorides, and Mg3N2. Well, remember, different numbers, that's my assumed one here, different numbers cross them over. I'm gonna need three chlorines for every one aluminum. I'm gonna need three magnesiums and two nitrogens. Al, the assumed one, is here. You don't usually write the one, but it's assumed. Cl3 and Mg3N2. How'd you do with that? Okay, let's go on to the next slide here. Again, names. How do we put the names together? I showed you the names of the ions earlier. Well, if you just stick it together. The metal, named just like it is on the periodic table. The non-metal, you give it an IDE ending. And again, you always name the metal first, and then the non-metal. Sodium fluoride, magnesium bromide, aluminum oxide. Not too bad, right? 
What you'll notice is when we write names, especially when you're looking at something like this, AL203, a lot of students try to include dies and tries or buys or prefixes to indicate quantity. Okay? We never, ever, ever indicate quantity in our ionic compounds. Okay? Never indicate quantity. That's just it. Keep the naming simple. Okay. Keep the naming simple. Name your metal just like it is. Name your non-metal with the IDE ending. Stick it together. Okay. Whoops. Looks like some of my names ran off here. Here's a couple more examples. Na is sodium. Cl is chlorine, which changes to chloride, so it's sodium chloride. K is potassium. Potassium. S is sulfur, which changes to sulfide. Mg is magnesium. O is oxygen. Magnesium oxide. Ca is calcium. I is iodine, which changes to iodide. And then Al is aluminum. And S is, again, sulfur, which changes to sulfide. Hopefully you see how that works. Okay. So, if you remember way back now, it's been several minutes since I talked about it, but I, when I was giving you the numbers at the tops of the columns, there were this big group in the middle of transition metals that I said, don't worry about those, we're going to talk about those later. Well, if you look right now, let me erase this, if you look at all the charges that I have written out on the periodic table, Here's my plus ones, my plus twos, I don't know why that's not there, um, plus threes, minus three, minus two, minus one. Okay, you will see, you will see the other things. You will see that in several boxes, in several boxes, I have the element listed twice with two different charges. And let's just look at, for instance, iron. Iron is a two plus and iron is a three plus. Okay, what in the world does that mean? Well, that means that depending on the situation, sometimes iron's a 2 plus and sometimes iron's a 3 plus. Sometimes iron gives away 2 electrons, sometimes iron gives 3 electrons away. Isn't that crazy? And so you can see that anything that has two different ions listed in the box, they can do different things. And for the most part, the rule is that, 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 that the transition metals do that, that they can do different things for the most part. Obviously, notice zinc here, cadmium, okay, silver. They only have one possible ion that they can form. But for the vast majority of the transition metals, they can do different things. And that's going to be important here in a second. The other kind of exception to the rule, do you know what Sn and Pb are? Do you know what those two elements are? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You can go look it up. Uh, those two elements are in the group four, which is where carbon sits right here. And as I said, we didn't label that column. One, because carbon can't make up its mind. But for the second reason we didn't label the column is because the metals that sit down here do different things. So I can't label the column and say everything in this column will always be a plus something or a minus. It, it won't. Okay? Different things. So how do we distinguish between them? Well, that's what we're going to look at next. Okay, so those crazy, funky transition metals. Here's the deal. And in fact, I'd rather you look at this table right here. This pretty much explains it. The names of those transition metals, first of all, like any metal, we don't change the name. It does not get a different ending like the non-metals. CR is chromium. CU is copper. AU is gold. FE is iron. PB is lead. You see where I'm going. You never change the name of the metal, the root name. But if it's a transition metal that can have two or more different names, okay, we're just going to look at the two, you use Roman numerals, Roman numerals, to indicate, again, not quantity in terms of how many do I need of each, but to indicate the charge, the quantity on the charge for that particular ion. So notice chromium 2 plus is chromium 2. Chromium when it's 3 plus is chromium 3. Copper with the assumed plus one is copper one. Copper two plus is copper two. You see that? That's pretty simple, right? 
So you've got to know the charge, you've got to know the charge on the transition metal to be able to name it. And that, that can be a little tricky. So for instance, if we look at these guys here, and in fact, let's pretend we don't know what the names are, okay? Um, let's do, let's pick a tricky one. Let's do Cu3P. If you just had this formula and you were told to name it, well, you always name the metal just as it is on the periodic table. Cu is copper. You take the non-metal and you change it to an IDE ending, so phosphorus becomes phosphide. And then last thing when the ionic compounds, name the metal. Name the nonmetal, give it the IDE ending. But the last thing, the last thing to do is check and see if that metal is a transition metal or one of those exceptions over underneath carbon that can have different charges. If it can have different charges, you've got one more piece to the puzzle here before you're done with the name. And that is determine what the charge on the transition metal is and use the Roman numerals to indicate what that charge is. So how do we figure that out? Well, again, let's remember the idea that my positive cation charge plus my negative anion charge, these guys all come together to make neutral, zero charged compounds. Okay, well still, Liz, Dr. Liz, what does that have to do with anything? Okay, well we've got our formula, Cu3P1. So I have one phosphorus, and if you go check out, go back a few slides and check it out, phosphorus always forms a minus three ion. And the chemical formula, this is an assumed one. So I just have one of the negative three ions. One times negative three is negative three. Copper, here's what I don't know. And again, we're going to assume I don't really know that because I'm trying to name it, show you how it's named. Each copper is the unknown charge, what I'm looking for. But what I do know is that there's three of them. Well, okay, so before I even get to that piece, let's just ask you this question. What plus a negative three equals zero? What plus a negative three equals zero? Well, positive three, right? So the sum of the cation component, or the positive ion in this system, the sum has to be positive three. But there's quantity three of them, okay? Call that three x, but I don't know. So when I divide both sides by 3, the total has to add up to 3, but there's 3 of them. 3 times my unknown charge, we'll just call x, equals 3. So what does x equal? That's right, you guys should do that basic algebra. x equals a positive 1. So each copper, each copper in this particular ionic compound, each copper must have a plus 1 charge. Positive 1 times 3 of them, times quantity 3, is positive 3. 1 phosphorus times a negative 3 charge is negative 3. Positive, plus negative, positive 3 plus negative 3 equals 0. Okay, That's a little tricky, guys. So practice maybe the other ones. Um, even though I've scribbled all over them, let me erase this here. Okay, Maybe, tr maybe take the other so many and see if you can justify that name. Okay. Again, the hardest part is figuring out what the charge on the transition metal is. All right, here's some practice for you. I want you to hit pause, hit pause, work these out, and then come back and check your answers when you're ready. Okay, so Fe2, S3, Fe is iron, S is sulfur, which changes to sulfide. But I'm not done yet because I've got to figure out what's the Roman numeral, what's the charge on iron, because iron can have different charges. So when you work out the math, it has to add up to zero. I have quantity three sulfur or sulfide ion. And I have quantity two times my unknown charge of iron. Well, I know that this has to add up to a positive six because to neutralize the negative 6, I've got to have positive 6. So we'll call it 2x equals a plus 6, divide by 2. Again, 2 was my quantity on my iron. Okay. The charge on each iron must be 3. So iron 3 sulfide. Did you get that? If you did not get it, Hopefully you followed what I just did. I want you to hit pause again before I go through and check your answer for the copper one. <laughs> I don't want to say what it is, but 
hit pause and come back when you're ready. Okay, how about the copper one now? Copper, Cu is copper, O is oxygen, which we changed to oxide. But what's the charge on that copper? This one's a little easier because I have quantity one of each. So it has to add up to zero. Each oxygen is a minus two. So what plus a minus two equals zero? Well, positive two. And there's only one copper, so that's what it has to be, okay? What plus a negative two equals zero? A positive two, and there's only one. So that's it, copper two oxide. There's your answer for B. Okay, now let's try the others. Let's go in the other direction. The correct formula for each of the following. So this I'm hoping you might find a little easier. Okay, so A, I'll work A out with you, and then B, I'm going to leave you to try. So copper one nitride. Copper we know, oh, sorry guys, fix that. Copper we know is Cu. And because they tell me Roman numeral one, well actually, what you may have just struggled with now, hopefully you don't. Copper one means it's a copper plus one ion. Nitride comes from the non-metal nitrogen, and that always has a three minus. Okay, so the question is, how do these two ions come together to make a neutral compound? Well, remember my shortcut rule. When you have two different numbers, cross them over to give you your quantity, meaning I'm gonna need three coppers for every one nitride ion. So Cu3N, and we don't ever write the one. It's just assumed if it's there, there must be at least one. And I only need one of them, that's it. Cu3N, which again, pardon my subscript, superscript, that's that one right there. All right, I want you to pause it. I want you to try B and come back and check your work here in a second. All right, you ready to solve B? So B is lead four, whoops, four oxide. Oh, this is a tricky one. Oh, I don't like this one. This is the only one where crossover doesn't work. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. But you know what? I'm actually glad we're gonna do this because it'll show, show me or tell you how to know when crossover won't work. So here's when you know crossover won't work. And this is the only time. It's when you have a four and a two combination when you have a four and a two combination, which you very rarely have, but lead oxide's a fairly common compound. There's just not many times that we're gonna use it compared to everything else that we'll be looking at. So when you have a four and a two, the crossover won't work. Instead, think about back to what does the plus four and what does the minus two charge mean? Plus four means I have lead looking to give four electrons away. Well, once it gives four away, that's the charge it has. But in other words, it's got four electrons it's looking to give away. Oxygen is always, and each oxygen is always, looking for two. Lead has four to give away. Oxygen's looking for two. So in other words, one lead can satisfy two oxygens. So the formula is PB1O2. I'll say that one more time. Based on the four plus charge, we know that lead is looking to give four away. That would give it that, that charge. Lead wants to give four away. Each oxygen is looking for two. So if you're lead and you're standing there with four electrons in your hand, you can satisfy two oxygens because each one wants two. Okay, so PbO2. That'd be this guy here. All right, now let's throw one more little monkey wrench here in our thing. And that is that in addition to just a metal and a non-metal, we have these things called polyatomics. Poly means multiple, atomic meaning atoms. And these are, as it says here, groups of atoms that have an overall ionic charge. Now, there are, and you're going to see on the next slide, there are tons of these. Um, I've pulled out a few here on this page. I have a few more on another page. There's lists of them in your book. There's all sorts of polyatomics. These just happen to be some of the most common. And, and you probably, I'm hoping, have heard of some of these things. Hydroxide, ammonia. Well, you've probably heard of ammonia, but ammonium, its cousin. Um, nitrate, carbonate, phosphate. 
a hydrogen carbonate, that's a bicarbonate, baking soda, um, but these are polyatomics, groups of atoms that have an overall ionic charge. The good news is that these guys are going to behave just like a piece of the two that come together to make an ionic compound. So in other words, ionic compounds always have two pieces, a positive piece and a negative piece. And regardless of whether that piece is a single element like sodium or whether it's a polyatomic like ammonium or hydroxide or whatever, it's treated the same. You still look at your ratio. Is it one to one? Is it different and I cross them over? All those rules still apply. So although this is a little confusing at first, I hope you see that it's not much more work um, if it's a polyatomic. All right, so here's some compounds that have polyatomics in them, okay? And you can read through. Um, for the most part, a lot of these things are used in medicine, um, so that's why these are listed. But there are thousands of different compounds that contain polyatomics. So let's take a look and figure out if we can determine how these things are being named. So Ba is barium. That's a metal. It's named just like a metal like an ionic compound. These are ionic compounds. SO4, however, it's not just a single element. It's not just sulfur or it's not just oxygen. It's a combination of sulfur and oxygen. And in fact, it's what's called sulfate. As an ion, this is what it looks like. This is the sulfate ion, okay? It's the negative piece where barium's the positive piece, at least in this particular compound, okay? Remember, everything has two pieces. Almost always it's a metal and a non-metal, but it could be a polyatomic to a non-metal or a polyatomic and a combination, okay? But you always have two pieces, something that has a positive charge, something that has a negative charge. That's why it's an ionic compound. Things that have charges are called ions. And it's just a matter of where the two pieces come from, whether it's just an individual element or whether it's a polyatomic, still works out the same way. So again, talking about barium sulfate, notice the chemical formula up here. It's just BASO4, one barium, one sulfate. Well, I'm telling you this, but look at the charge on sulfate. I'm telling you it's a two minus. What's the charge on barium? Well, look at where it is on the periodic table, two plus. When the numbers are the same, remember you have a one to one ratio. One barium will satisfy one sulfate. So the chemical formula is BASO4. That's it, one of each. What about when you have different combinations? So for instance, calcium, let's look at this guy. Calcium is on the same column as barium on the periodic table. It's a positive two ion. And right here, the sky PO4, it's called phosphate or the phosphate ion when it's just by itself. And that's the charge on that ionic ion polyatomic, polyatomic ion, I guess is really the right way to say it. So when I'm trying to put these two pieces together, again, I, all I look at, what are the charges? If they're different, cross them over. I'm going to need two phosphates and I'm going to need three calciums. Ca3, I need three calciums, and remember your algebra days, whenever you need more than one of something that has a sub subscript like that, you simply use parentheses. I need two of this whole piece, two phosphates. Stick the formula for phosphate in parentheses and put your quantity on the outside. You never, ever, 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 did I, did I say ever, ever change the quantities, the numbers on the polyatomics. And I say that because PO4 is a different substance than PO3. Okay? You can't change the subscripts on your polyatomics. All you can do is take more than one quantity. Looking at the quantity, I need two PO4s. You put the quantity on the outside like it's done here. Okay? And you can see there's a couple that have numbers on the outside. PO4 again, I have phosphate, but I've got two of them here. Zinc is three. Okay, you see where I'm going with that. So when you name with polyatomics, you name the first piece, if it's a metal, just like you did before, go to the periodic table, look up the name. BA is barium, CA is calcium, AG is silver, NA is sodium. 
Zn is zinc, Fe is iron, and oops, iron's going to be a funky one, but we know how to how that where that came from. And then the second piece, if it's a polyatomic, you pull the name off the chart of polyatomics. SO4 is sulfate, CO3 is carbonate. It's on the chart. Okay, look it up. You don't have to memorize it. Look up the name and you write it down. That's it. So when you're using a polyatomic, unlike when you just have a, an element by itself like NAC, oops, NACL, chlorine changed to chloride. Well, when you have a polyatomic, you don't change the ending. You write it exactly as it is on the chart. Okay, um, just kind of some interesting information to leave you with. Um, ions in our body, as I said, um, if you remember from what seems like an hour ago, um, chlorine, Cl2, it's diatomic, remember? It's extremely toxic, okay? However, chloride ions we consume in our diet through salt all the time, okay? This is very non-toxic. Well, here are some ions. In fact, the chloride ion is down there. We actually need chloride ions in our bodies to survive. It's present in our um, gastric juice, like your stomach acid, things like that. It helps regulate body flu bodily fluid. So in fact, not only is it non-toxic, it's essential for life. Okay? Huge difference. And so the ions had different properties compared to their cousins the neutral atoms. For instance, sodium. If I brought sodium into a room, more than likely it would explode. Just neutral sodium atoms because it's so reactive. It's just looking to give an electron away. But sodium ion, well guess what? Sodium ion, again, likes we use it, and we consume it in the salt. We need it to regulate and control bodily fluids. If you've taken biology at all, you might know about sodium pumps. And if you don't, that's okay. Um, but they're used in our body. We need it. And all these different things we need in our, in our bodies to live. Um, over here, some interesting things. Again, most of you want to go into the medical field. Um, you can read what happens if you have too little of these particular ions or if you have too much. So in other words, it really needs to be regulated. It's not just, eh, I can consume a little bit and be okay. You need to consume the right amount. Look at what can happen. Cardiac arrest if you have too much potassium, okay? Things that can mean life or death for us. It's really important that these are regulated. And, and if you're working already in the medical field, you may be familiar with some of these and, and you may be familiar with when patients get IV bags and IVs um, pumped in with solutions with some of these ions present, okay? That's what I will leave you with for our ionic compound section.